Hi there, come on in. It's Thursday night, September 27th, the year 2001. You know, bow season for deer opens on October 1st. Now, is there such thing as a truly straight arrow? I'll show you some interesting slow motion footage of arrow flight, along with other amazing inventions, such as the bow that can shoot two arrows rapid fire. I have some truly amazing DNR news and a lot more, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. Harold Ziegler Ford in Lowell didn't sell a lot of vehicles on Saturday, September 15th. The nation was still reeling from the terrorist attack on the 11th, and the 15th was not only the opening of small game season in Michigan, but it was the last appearance of Reese, the seven-year-old buck that turned Bill Yoder's life upside down in a matter of minutes on that fateful November day in 1997. The tines on Reese's antlers penetrated Bill Yoder's body in more than 30 places. Some of these wounds were internal, where Bill fights life-threatening infections every day. Neil is another one of Bill's trophy bucks with a record book rack. Like Reese, Neil is docile most of the year, except in the fall when his behavior is aggressive and unpredictable. Bill domesticates big deer so the public can see them up close. Big bucks, huh? How are you? <laughs> Bill's biggest buck of all is Conrad, which he nicknamed Bam Bam because of his belligerence during the rut. Well, tell me about uh, this one. This is the first one to lose its velvet. velvet. Of the older ones, all my yearlings have lost their velvet about a week now. Uh, the bigger ones usually goes longer, they carry a little longer. I don't know, because maybe because there's more to lose and takes them a little longer to develop. But this is just a three-year-old. I mean, it looks like it hurts. Yeah, but it's just hard, it's hard bone. And it's just like skin on a bone or, you know, it just, it just peel right off. He hasn't been rubbing very much. He's rubbing a little bit. He'll start rubbing more from now on. It's now, still drying. Now, what happened to the end of, uh that he was, right going, he was going to grow more points and he just ran out of growing time. Hmm. You know, he's growing so fast. Next year you probably have three or four more points on that end. But he has kind of a mess down there around yeah. his uh, burr. Yeah. What's he, going on there? He just non-typical. That's 14 inches around this side, the base. He went from a straight 11 point last year to 19 points over an inch long this year. How old is he? Three years old. So Three? Huge body. He's just a super genetic deer. One in a million. Now, he's going to be going to the auction? Right. What's he going to fetch? Well, I'm not going to sell him under 25000 He's got to bring a lease out or I'll bring him home. Hmm. Because he is young and he's, and he's got so much potential, his genetics are super. They sold a three-year-old last year up there. It wasn't even this good. They got 95000 out of one deer. Wow. Whoever buys Bam Bam at the auction will give him a good, safe home because his genetics are worth a fortune. Bill isn't liquidating his deer in his trailer just for the money, though. He has a mountain of ongoing medical bills from the goring he barely survived in 1997, but it's not the money. It's the daily care and work involved in raising deer that have become too much for Bill physically. The blood on Bam Bam's antlers is his own, not Bill's. It's from the drying velvet, and Bam Bam doesn't feel a thing. I have a lot of interesting videotape of Bill and his bucks, which we'll look at from time to time in the years ahead. But Bill Yoder will not be taking his live big game exhibit around the country anymore. You might see some of these tame bucks if they're auctioned to someone who wants to carry on Yoder's traveling educational show, but it's more likely that the deer that Bill Yoder raised will be pampered and protected as breeding stock in private deer herds around the country. If it weren't for the change in behavior of these wild animals during their breeding season, from gentle and playful in the summer to belligerent and hostile to anyone and everyone during the mating season, Bill Yoder would not have been attacked by his own buck, and he wouldn't be walking the line between life and death every day from those wounds that haven't healed. 
This Saturday, September 29th, the last of okay. the Yoder live big game show. The big bucks, the trailer, and the truck will be auctioned off to the highest bidder. And all of us who know Bill and love him hope that the bids are outrageous, that he gets top dollar for everything. Because Bill Yoder and his traveling educational live big game show brought a part of nature to the public that few people ever get to see close up. Bill hopes that people have learned through his misfortune that the wild in wild animals is dangerous and something nobody should ever forget. It's been a long road, and for Bill, a tough one since his fateful encounter with Reese. Even though we'll miss seeing Bill in the traveling road show, we hope Bill's life will become easier, happier, and definitely more healthy. The final appearance of Bill Yoder's live big game show was September 15th. Thanks, Bill. We've loved and appreciated everything you've done. Hunting white-tailed deer with a bow and arrow is an ultimate challenge. Now, what makes it so tough is that the hunter has to get close to the deer, very close. A heavy compound bow with a well, 70 or 80-pound draw weight can reach out 30, 40 yards if the bow hunter is a good shot. But lighter weight bows demand that the hunter be closer, 20 yards or so from the deer. Now, some states and provinces have regulations requiring a minimum 45-pound draw weight. A lot of women, teenagers, and even men who have physical disabilities cannot pull back and shoot a 45-pound bow accurately. But with lighter weight bows at shorter ranges, they can take deer as well as anybody. Should there be a minimum restriction on bow hunters? Well, before you make up your mind, listen to the story of one hunter who gears up with a lightweight bow. Now, a lot of people are going to say, can't be done. <laughs> What was, what was the draw weight on your bow? 28 pounds. Now, haven't people told you that that's not heavy enough to hunt deer with? No, Nobody because I've taken 10, so they kind of believe I can do it now in the family, yeah. 10 deer with a 28 pound mm -hmm. bow? Is and not only that, I've seen two of them fall, you know, hit them hard enough that they fell within range of being able to see them. So. How close do you shoot? About 20 yards. This one was at 20, yeah. So you don't shoot much more, you don't do 30-yard no, shots or no. anything? No, I don't think I'd get enough penetration. I only got about six inches probably, hit one long. But that's, that's really it all you need. That's right. He only went about 300 yards, I guess. Oh. That's, I mean, 10 deer in how many years? About 18 bull hunting, but I gun hunt also, and I've taken 10 with a gun. So I've got 20 all total. Are those box does, what's the? Uh, about 14 bucks and some does, but some of the bucks were small ones, you know, not <laughs> naturally not like this. But like, what do you call a small one? Well, button bugs, spike horns, a lot of spike horns up okay, in the state well, we're land. On, yeah. We're on the same wavelength then. Yeah, right. I thought maybe you were working down to no. eights and tens. No. You know. <laughs> well, that's great. Jeez, I, feel, I, I, I never dreamed, you know, coming up here that you got this with a 28-pound bow. I mm -hmm. would have thought that maybe you'd start cranking the bow up to 35 or... I cranked it up one time a few years ago when I'd been to the gym and worked out, and the first deer that came in on a nice cool morning, I had trouble getting the bow pulled back. I had to do one of these big... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, put it back down where I can pull it comfortably and... And shoot accurately. There. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Be darn. Great story. Yeah. Let's have a big round of applause for Linda Luna with a 28-pounder. Tenth! Tenth deer. I'm, I'm impressed. I understand also it's going to be probably the largest deer for a woman bow hunter. The uh, recording period's not over till the end of March, but it may be a new record. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Using a lightweight bow for deer isn't a problem if the hunter restricts shooting to 20 yards or less. There are two reasons. One, the arrow will maintain enough velocity to guarantee sufficient penetration to kill the deer humanely. And two, a reasonably good archer can maintain accuracy within 20 yards. Bows with heavier draw weights are preferred, though, because they shoot arrows faster, and faster arrows don't have the arching trajectory of slower arrows, which makes them easier to shoot accurately. In this quest for speed, bow hunters have done several things. They've gone to arrows that are smaller in diameter and lighter weight, They've gone to compound bow designs that have oblong cams instead of round wheels. Those oblong cams snap the string faster when they're released. And archers have gone to release aids that clip onto the string instead of using their fingers to release the arrow. But what effect do these improvements have on arrow accuracy? 
The Easton Aluminum Company, which dominates the market with aluminum arrows, produced a video where a variety of bows and arrows and releases were photographed shooting arrows in super slow motion. Let's just look at three of these. First, a bow shot with fingers. In slow motion, you can see the string rolls off the shooter's fingers, so it starts a little off-center. Halfway out the bow, it's clear off the arrow rest, which bends the arrow sideways. This straightens out after the arrow leaves the bow. The flight stabilizes. But what happens in the split second after the shooter lets the arrow fly looks pretty scary. With that kind of stress on an arrow, you can see why the shooter has to release the arrow consistently every time. Otherwise, accuracy will be inconsistent. Now let's take a look at a cam bow, the fastest type on the market today. We'll solve the sideways motion of the string by using a mechanical release aid. But oblong cams on a compound snap the string so fast at the beginning of the acceleration that the arrow actually bows up vertically. The veins flap like the fins on a fish because the arrow is oscillating up and down. With heavy draw weights and cams, the arrows have to be matched perfectly with the bow or that fast acceleration will bend an arrow way out of shape in the first few inches of travel and a mismatched arrow won't shoot accurately. Now the third example, a heavier, larger diameter hunting arrow shot with a release aid. This is close to perfect arrow travel without warping or bending. A wheel bow doesn't have the initial acceleration quite as fast as a cam bow, and the heavier arrow gets a slower launch than the lighter arrow, but it releases clean, holds its shape, and for most shooters, this combination will be more accurate. Now, all three of these can be accurate. The kind of equipment you choose is up to you, as long as it's tuned and balanced and you stick within the limitations of penetration and accuracy, how you gear up is your choice but how you shoot when you're hunting is your responsibility. So choose wisely and shoot responsibly. That's the key to gearing up. How do you build your muscles for archery without pulling your ball? Well, Saunders came up with a perfect solution. It's an exerciser they call the power pull exercising the same muscles you use for archery. The beauty of it is you can develop your bow pulling muscles anytime, anywhere. Saunders is also marketing a device for release shooters who want to practice dry snapping their releases, something you cannot do on a bow without an arrow. Dry snapping will crack the limbs. Again, you can practice with your release anytime, anyplace without arrows. As for practical targets, Ed Urban from Owasso tried stuffing a feed sack full of plastic bags. You know those paper or plastic stuff from the supermarket? He found that the plastic bags have tremendous arrow stopping ability, and recycling these bags takes a little of the guilt out of asking for plastic at the supermarket. Ed got this idea from Tom Phelps from Coldwater, who found a source for scraps of hollow fill. It's an insulation material for sleeping bags and coats. He stuffs hollow fill into burlap bags. Now we found both targets stop arrows well, and the best thing is that the arrows come out easily. Two fingers does it. No, 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 actually the best thing is you can make these targets yourself and they cost little or nothing. It can't get any more practical than that. Explain to me this uh, third lens you have in your glasses, Earl. Well, I shoot underneath my glasses. I look very close to my nose, so I use the lens to be able to see my sight pen. You mean, put your, can you just pull up and draw so we, we can look at I it this way? Hand. And use your hands. Okay. So you draw and you're using the peep sight. Okay. Well, that's right. So, oh, I see. That moves your glasses up, and you're looking. Is that like a bifocal? Yes. And you look right down through the sight pen. Yep. Interesting. Where'd you get that? I made it. You did? Yes. What kind of material is the lens? It's a plastic safety glass type of material. Huh. Normal manufacturer of eyeglasses. Now, when you're shooting, what does the target look like? Perfectly good. It does? Yes. Yes, target's fine. And so is the sight, the whole... whole I can see here? this. See, my glasses, my prescription is I can see about this far, and then from that point on, I can't see for the next foot or so real clear. Hmm. That's where my sight pen is, so I use this third lens to be able to see my sight pen, and it's clear at a distance. Do you use this for hunting? Mm, this is, I just made it this summer. What do you think, you can use it for hunting? Yes. <laughs> okay, well good. Be interesting to see how you do. Yeah, better than last year, I hope. <laughs> <laughs>
bow hunters have always had the problem of where to put their bows while they're waiting for deer, which can be hours. Sport Shield Manufacturing developed a unique bow holder they call the Rest. It straps around your leg. The bottom wheel of your compound rests in the pouch. The top is held by a hook. Leaves your hands free, but the bow is ready. What do you think for $18? Amazing or amusing? Another problem archers have is keeping the arrow on the arrow rest. Tip your bow and the arrow falls off, which can scare a deer and blow your chances. To solve this, the Stay Put Arrow Holder was developed, a small piece of soft silicone material that holds the arrow in place, but when you shoot it, it flies out of the way. No effect on the arrow flight. At $14, what do you think? Amazing or amusing? And here's a wild product marketed by Scott Yarborough of Sky Manufacturing. This is the new Ultraloader 2000, which is an automatic arrow loader, which allows you to shoot two arrows in as little time as about three seconds. When you shoot the first arrow, the energy stored in the limbs triggers this latch mechanism, which allows the second over arrow to flip over onto your rest right in front of your string. At that point, all you have to do is to push the string into the knock, it'll hold it there, and then as you draw back with, with either fingers or release, you, the clamp opens up out of the way and you're ready to shoot instantaneously. How long does it take to get off two shots? Knock, draw, shoot. That took exactly three seconds. You let go. The spring is released that turns the second arrow over directly in line with the string. You push the string into the knock. The arrow holder flips out of the way when you draw. There's no way your eye can catch what's happening at regular speed, but when we slow it down, you can see. The hinged mechanism is simple enough so that it works flawlessly. All you do is engage the string onto the knock and pull back. Your second arrow is ready. It's an intriguing concept, but at $69, will most archers find the ultra loader amazing or amusing? My opinion of DNR policies in recent years, especially this year, has gone far beyond amazing and amusing. I, I don't even know what to say about it. When I got the antlerless guide here to look over for antlerless permits, I decided that's it. Way too complicated. It just sounded nuts to me. I mean, I used to be happy getting one deer a year. So I decided I'm just going to get the combination license. I'm going to shoot one deer with my gun. It's going to be a buck, any kind of buck I want. And I'm going to take one deer with my bow, which will be an antlerless deer, probably the first one that comes along. I just don't have that much time. And I certainly don't have the patience to go through all of this DNR rigmarole, but that's nothing compared to what's happened recently. Remember uh, in year 2000 and in the past 30 years, the way the DNR talked about deer management units, they had them drawn up around the state, uh, all different sizes and shapes to correspond with the habitat. Well, to complete the politicalization of deer management, now this year they've announced that the deer management units are the counties in the lower peninsula. That's the political subdivisions of the state. If that weren't enough, that reversal. Check this out. The Northwoods Call just reported that the DNR has lifted the baiting ban in the TB hot zone up in Area 452. Can you believe it? The big fuss over banning baiting. Now this year, just recently, the DNR commission issued the order. Now baiting is legal up there. Uh, one gallon a day of corn or grain. I mean, come on, who can keep up with these regulations? What's legal one year is illegal the next and legal again. I don't know what you think about it, but I'm absolutely floored. What is that you're doing with that paintbrush? Basically, uh Birds get dusty real easy, and this just takes the dust off them. It helps pull the splits and the feathers back together. Um, just helps them flow. And it's like brushing your hair, only with feathers it takes on that real soft brush. To... Now is this something that people should do at home with their mounts? It certainly would help them, at least get the dust off and, and brighten them up a little bit.
Just go with the feather. Always go with the feather. Hmm. Now what in the heck is this? This is a, a, a small snow goose. Now snow geese, okay. Now the, the black wing tips, that's kind of the key, huh? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on snow geese. A lot of people believe that blue geese are the results of some snow geese. Um, there's a lot of interbreeding involved. Um, I look at it as a goose is a goose, and he's white and looks like a snow goose, so he's a snow goose. Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of variables that can occur in, in that family. And well, this one isn't totally white. Is yes. that normal? Yes and no. Um, like I said, there's a lot of variations. It could be a young blue goose, um, and as it matures, it will turn into the, the darker, darker colors on the back and the body. And Where was this taken? Uh, Manitoba. Hmm. It's a pretty bird. Yeah, it's a beautiful bird. It's got a lot of character to it. And I'm quite happy with it. Dear hunters, remember, for a Marbles Hunting Award, you either need 10 antler points or an outside spread of 18 inches or more, or a single tine could be a spike buck or a four point that has 10 inch tines or longer. So that will get you a Marbles Award. We already have the patches in stock for the 2001 awards. This year's Big Buck Night, by the way, will be December 6th on public TV. Now, Big Spike Night, from last year, I'm going to have coming up in two weeks. I hope you have a good weekend. Enjoy yourself. I want to see you back here next week. Well, here we are. Spacious pumpkin tent. Now, this is camping, a bargain type of camping situation. You can see, basically, we're set up with a sleeping area here and a cooking area over here. If you think you're too old to rough it, you're not too old to reminisce. Join me on The Practical Sportsman for Deer Camp the Old Fashioned Way. That's coming up next week right here on Public TV. It's clear off the arrow rest, which bends the arrow sideways. This straightens out after the arrow leaves the bow. The flight stabilizes. But what happens in the split second after the shooter lets the arrow fly looks pretty scary. With that kind of stress on an arrow, you can see why the shooter has to release the arrow consistently every time. Otherwise, accuracy will be inconsistent. Now let's take a look at a cam bow, the fastest type on the market today. We'll solve the sideways motion of the string by using a mechanical release aid. But oblong cams on a compound snap the string so fast at the beginning of the acceleration that the arrow actually bows up vertically. The veins flap like the fins on a fish because the arrow is oscillating up and down. With heavy draw weights and cams, the arrows have to be matched perfectly with the bow, or that fast acceleration will bend an arrow way out of shape in the first few inches of travel, and a mismatched arrow won't shoot accurately.